Yep, the Rebbe, the Messiah, and the Orthodox indifference. I wanted to read something here because I think it's very important that we not um, belittle any movement whatsoever, and, and by no means is that's my intention. But those of you who have seen my series on the Rebbe, the Messiah, and the Orthodox indifference knows there's some things that must be discussed, even though a lot are offended by my words because I only replicated them um, by the words of Rabbi um, David, uh, the author of the book, the Rebbe, the Messiah, and the scandal of the Orthodox indifference, Rabbi David Berger. And he has an incredible appendix in page, um, towards the end of the book, which is worth reading and just sharing with the general uh, YouTube audience. As you know, Rabbi David Berger is a scholar in the area of not only Judaism, but also in Christian thought. And uh, he mentions, especially the polemical literature is replete with arguments that the Messiah could not have come or that Jesus could not have been the Messiah. Because the prophecies of the end days remain unfulfilled, in most cases, these two formulations appear, uh, according to David Berger, Rabbi Berger, formulation appears interchangeable, since the very definition of the concept of Messiah, quote-unquote, is rooted in biblical description of visible global redemption. Judaism properly recoiled from the scenarios without a shred of biblical justification, in which the Messiah's mission is interrupted by death in an unprecedented and unredeemed world. The God of the Hebrew Bible sends the Messianic King to accomplish his end, not to follow a two-part script in which the hero tragically dies and, in the words to be continued, suddenly appears on the screen. The Jewish denial of this possibility has been expressed in various forms throughout the ages. The appendix, which is a very good one, by the way, and I encourage you to buy Rabbi David Berger's book, so this is my, my must-have book in your library, whether you're Hasidic or not, I, I really encourage every single Jew, uh, every single person interested in this topic about the Messiah, to definitely get a copy of this book. And there, are, these are the three uh, things that he's presenting. These are from Maimonides, Nachmanides, and the Sefer Haberit. And appeared all part of his book. Uh, number one, the Midrash Bereshit Rabbah. Interesting sight, citation. Our father Jacob saw Samson, Shimshon, he was, a, he was a judge in the prophetic vision, and he thought he was the King Messiah, Melech HaMashiach. Once he saw that he died, it says in Midrash Bereshit Rabbah 98, once they saw he died, he said, this one too has died, for salvation, I, for thou salvation I will await, O Lord. Interesting enough. Jacob ben Reuben in Milchamot Hashem, this was in 1170 of the current common era, the edition of Judah Rosenthal of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem in 1963, page 78, and he says, And this is the name by which ye shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, verse 6. You, the Christians, said that the Messiah is called the Lord our righteousness. Now, according to your words, how can you say the Messiah of yours reigned as king and prospered? How were Judah and Israel delivered in his days? And how did they dwell securely, according to Jeremiah 23, verse 5 through 6? This figure is the true Messianic king, as it is written afterwards. Assuredly, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when it shall no more be said, as the Lord lives, lives who brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt, but rather as the Lord lives, who brought out and led forth the offspring of the house of Israel and from the northern land and from the land to which I have banished them. And they shall dwell upon their own soil. Jeremiah 23, verse 7 through 8. And all of this has not yet come to pass. <laughs> Very well. Maimonides. Now we're looking in the year 1138 through the year 12. 04, Mishnah Torah, Laws of Kings, chapter 2, verse 4. In the uncensored version, not the one that was changed later on to make it suitable for some to be able to utilize Rambam as a source. If a king arises from the house of David who studies the Torah and pursues the commandments like his ancestor David, in accordance with the written and oral law, 
And he compels all Israel to follow and strengthen it and fights the wars of the Lord. And these are literal wars. These are not figuratively. The man enjoys the presumption of being the Messiah. If he proceeds successfully, defeats all the nations surrounding him, builds the temple in its place and gather the dispersed of Israel, then he surely is the Messiah. But if he does not succeed to the extent or is killed, it is evident that he is not the one whom the Torah promised. Rather, like all the complete and righteous king of Israel who have died, Jesus of Nazareth, who imagined the world that he would be the Messiah, caused Israel to stumble. But no human being can grasp the thought the thoughts of God, for our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. In fact, the events surrounding Jesus of Nazareth and the Ishmaelite Muhammad, who came after him, were for the purpose of straightening the way for the King Messiah and preparing the entire world so that all will serve the Lord together as is written. When he says all, Rambam is including both Christian and Muslims. Let me say that again. When the Rambam is referring to this, he's including both Christians and Muslims because in Muslim theology or eschatology, last day's event, they look for Jesus to come back along with their imam, as it were, their leader, and will bring everybody to subjection, to submission, and anyone who opposes, they will kill them. Interesting enough, even Muslims understand that Jesus will come back. Hmm? A Jew will lead the whole entire thing. Which is interesting because if you look at all three religions, it's interesting the, the different perspective of the eschatology that, that, that is developed behind here. Eschatology means the study of the last days or apocalyptic ideologies. One way or the other, the Jews are still involved. <laughs> For then I will make the people of pure speech, so they all invoke the Lord by name and serve him with one accord. Zechariah chapter, I'm sorry, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. How is this so? Because Christianity and Islam, the entire world, has been filled with the discussion of the Messiah, the Torah, and the commandments. Of course, the Muslims say that we that we and the Christians have perverted our text. And yet it says in Surah, I don't remember what passage, but it says in Surah that if there's any doubting Muslims regarding who has the right version, who has the, the truth. Interesting enough, in the surah says you should check out the other two previous sources, which is Christianity and Judaism. Which the bottom line will tell you then, if that's the case, why don't you just go to the most previous one, with the whole thing started, Judaism. Just a thought. So how is it so? The commandments, the matter, the matters have spread to distant isles and so many benign nations. Who debate these issues and commandments of the Torah. Some say that they were true, but they were annulled in our times and since they were not intended for all generations. Others say there were hidden meanings in them, so they are not to be understood according to the plain sense. Rather, Messiah has already come and revealed their secrets. But when the King Messiah will truly arise, succeed and be exceedingly exalted, they will all repent and realize that their fathers, their forefathers, inherited falsehood, and their prophets and ancestors misled them. Imagine what the Rambam saying. The Rambam used to live in Spain, was basically had to leave because of the Inquisition, and went to the, the Islamic uh, countries. Having knowledge of both systems of thoughts, he tells the Jewish people, listen, they both will come to the recognition, they will both recognize that the errors that they've committed, and will go back to who? will attach themselves back to whom? To the Jews. Not as Muslims say, not as Christians say, but Ramam says, you know, they're going to come back and realize they were right all the time. In pondering the fate of the Jewish belief during the past seven years, says Berger, I have followed to speculate half seriously about a narrow, a narrow providential explanation of the rise of Christianity. And I wondered whether God might have allowed a form of non-pagan Avodah Zarah centered on a deceased Messiah to grow the maturity outside the Jewish community, so that the Jews formulate a response that they would be able to draw upon a resisting such development when it unfolds within. The extra, extraordinary hurdles that I face in this campaign, he's talking about the campaign he had to deal with uh, over the issue of another 
potential Messiah that was already had died, and they were making him into the Messiah alive. Um, and he succeeded by creating a an, an, an amendment in the uh, our, uh, the, uh, you know, the union of, of rabbinical of, of rabbis of America, RCA. Um, he, and he says this. Nonetheless, I hesitate to ascribe such a motive to God when it appears that the preparation that he has provided us to meet the challenge is providing insufficient when put to the test, he says. Very good. It doesn't stop there. Nachmanides. Barcelona Disputation, 1263. In the Kit Ve Rambam, edition Chavel 311. I cannot believe in Jesus' Messiahship, says Nachmanides. For the prophet said that in the time of the Messiah, no longer will they need to teach one another and say one to another, know the Lord. For all of them shall know me, says Jeremiah 31, 34. And it, is, and it also says, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Isaiah 11, verse 9. And it also says that they shall beat their swords into plowshare. Nations or nations shall not take up sword against nation. Others, war will, it will cease. They shall never again know war, Isaiah 2, 4. That's still what's happening. Just look at the Middle East, see what's happening there. And from the days of Jesus till today, the entire world is full of pillaging, robbery, wars. Indeed, how difficult it would be for you, my Lord, the King, says Nachmanides. And for your knights, if they would never again know war. Furthermore, the prophet says, coming concerning the Messiah, he shall strike down a land with the rod with his mouth, Isaiah 11.4. The question is, when did they strike down the land with his mouth? With words. Yagada explains, if the Messianic king is told, the nation has rebelled against you, he will say, let the locusts come and destroy it. And this was not the case with Jesus. In other words, nations want to fight the Messiah? Just by his declaration. By his response divine action will take a place upon that nation I already said about this in case Rabbi Meir ben Shimon Hama'ilil 13th century Melchemet Mitzvah and Shittat HaKadmonim Al Mitzvot Nazir Zevachim Arachim Utemura Vesefer Melchemet Mitzvah in the edition of Moshe Yehuda HaKohen, in 1973, says, Jesus called himself king. We maintain that the verse, Behold, your king is coming to you, in Zechariah 9.09. Oh, and he's riding on a, on a donkey. Was said, and he, yet, he grant, he, yet, yet he granted kingship to Caesar and commanded that tax be paid to the publicans. Remember the story that they tested him to see? He said, here, bring me the coin, let me tell you. What's, what is of Caesar is of Caesar. What is of God of God? This is what he's referring to. Thus he gave the lie. He gave the lie both to himself and to the prophecy of the prophet that the king of Messiah will be exalted above the king of the earth and that all of them will serve him, not that he and his fellowship will have to pay them taxes or serve them. Rather, they will be all subordinate to him and subservient to him, as it is written in the Psalms, that they will interpret to refer to him. Let all the kings bow to him. All the nations serve him. Psalm 72, 2. This man, on the contrary, was subservient to the kings and fearful of them. It is written that the Messiah, who is to come in the future, the righteous will flourish in his time. And the king's well, well-being will, be, will abound till moon is no more. Psalm 72, 6. It is written, and he will judge among the nations. Isaiah 2, 4. And he shall strike down a land with the rod of his mouth, Isaiah 11:4. And he shall strike down, uh, I'm sorry, and he shall proclaim peace to the nations, Shalom, Zechariah 9:10. Here is proof that the prophecy will be fulfilled in the future and has not yet been realized, since none of this was to be found in, in your Messiah, says Nachmanides to the king who happened to be Christian, Catholic or Christian. It is clear then. It will be fulfilled in the days of our Messiah, who will come speedily in our days. Now, that's an incredible citation. Now, we also have that of Moses HaKohen of Tortesillas, Ezer HaEmuna, 14th century. Rabbi Moses HaKohen, in his History of Judeo-Christian Controversy, in that chapter, 
where we find these words. There will be great peace in the world when our Messiah comes. As it says, in the days to come, the mount of the Lord, of the Lord's house, and many people shall go. And it is written, he, shall, he will judge among the nations. Isaiah 2, verse 2 through 4. And Micah, or Micah, prophesied similarly. Consequently, Isaiah says here, they will do nothing evil nor vile. Nothing evil nor vile. And if you say that Jesus was the Messiah, how was this prophecy fulfilled in his time? We can say that all the, prov the previous ones after Jesus as well. By Yom Tov Lipman Mulhausen and Sefer HaNitzachon, a shoot shall grow out of the stump of Jesse, a twig will sprout from his stalk. The Spirit of the Lord shall alight upon him, a spirit of wisdom, of insight, a spirit of counsel, of valor, a spirit of devotion and reverence for the Lord. Here, too, the Christian stumbled and referred this to the Nazarene. But it is explicit in the passage that this king will come regarding the redemption of Judah and Israel, as it is written in that day, as there was for Israel that day when it left the land of Egypt, Isaiah 11, verse 11 through 15. And these matters have not come to pass. Rabbi Shimon ben Sema Duran, the famous Duran, and Keshet Umagen, a critical edition of uh, Prosper Musiano, New York uh, dissertation in 1975, Jesus' mistakes was that he thought he would be the Messiah, like others in our history. But when he was hanged, his thought was annulled. In this edition reprinted by Maker, apparently page 111a, an erroneous reading is here rendered, and it renders the sentence a little bit in incoherent, says the author here. That he was the he was hanged, he was annulled. Now, Solomon Ibn Verga, all these Sephardis, if you notice, all these names, very Latin, Duran, Vega. In the edition of Azriel Shochet, in an account of Tortosa Disputation, referring to rabbinic assertion that Messiah was born on the day of the destruction of the temple, page 105, our belief and belief of every Jew is that if a man comes and gathers the dispersed of Israel, builds the temple, and all the nations gather to him and call out unanimously in the name of God, then we will say that he is Messiah. Any statement that appears to contradict this has an interpretation. Now, obviously, this concept of the Messiah has to build the temple is something of post first century. However, I want you to understand this that during the period of time that Jesus, according to the Christian New Testament, that Jesus was around, there was already known that the temple was going to be destroyed. There was Baraitas and uh, you might say Navua or Batkols that were saying that the temple that was there was going to be destroyed. Interesting enough, we know that is the case because there is an indication of this in the Christian New Testament when Jesus is confronted with the Pharisees and he tells the Pharisees, the Perushims, destroy this temple and in three days I will you know, rebuild it. And this he was alluding not as the, the author, the gospel author writes. Gospel author says this was in reference to his body and resurrection. See how it changes? It's called a reconstruction of his words. The text itself indicates that Jesus was not referring to about his body and his resurrection. He was referring to that temple that was known to be come destroyed. He was plainly saying, destroy this temple by your action, by your behaviorisms, and I will come and rebuild it. Now the question is, did he rebuild it? No. This is why later on the gospel writer had to change the interpretation of this story, these words of Jesus that was known among the followers of Jesus and had to give it a different mm, twist. Let's continue because it's very important here. Isaac ben Abraham Trochi. He was not even a, you might say, pro-rabbinical writer. He was actually a Karite. But his work is immensely popular among mainstream Jews who amended it and translated it and disseminated it widely. Why? 
because he dealt with the Pasuk of the Tanakh. We have many valid proofs contradiction Christian positions by demonstrating that Jesus was not the Messiah at all. The fourth is that the promise designated for the time of the awaited Messiah were not fulfilled in his time, and these matters are required conditions for believing in the true Messiah. In other words, he didn't fulfill it? Sorry, buddy. Can be claimed the Messiah. Till this time, no one has come to fulfill that. No matter who you want to propose as your candidate. Rabbi Yehuda Aryeh de Moderna, de Moderna, Magen Vacherev. Once we were speaking about the Messiah, whether he was Jesus, we cannot refrain from investigating the term Messiah and King, which are so inappropriate to the life he lived and the deeds he did. Let us begin with the universal practice of calling the future Redeemer Messiah. They too called him in Greek, Christos. So please don't be upset when Christians say Jesus Christ. Or in Spanish, Jesucristo. Or the Messianics say Yahushua HaMashiach. This all comes from the term anointed which is our Hebrew word, Mashiach. It's all the same thing. So don't try to say, well, this was Greek and this is Jewish. It's the same synonymous meaning. So when a Christian says Christ, he's referring to Messiah, Mashiach. So let's see how it's possible to say that this Nazarene could be the Christ, the Messiah. When and where was he anointed? Who anointed him? Everyone knows that those actually anointed were king and priest through the term Mashiach. It can sometimes be used metaphorically. In this case, it would surely refers to a real king with genuine authority, like that of David, who will rule over the house of Israel and the nations, and those kingship will be powerfully established. But where and over whom do, did Jesus rule? And where were the judgments and justice that he did in earth? Christians cite Zechariah 9 9 to show that the Messiah will be poor, and from this they prove a second fantasy that the Messiah will come twice. This is the words of Rabbi Yehuda Arye de Modena. Rabbi Pinchas Elijah Horowitz of Vilna, in his Sefer Haberit HaShalim, says, We are obligated to believe that the Jewish man will come who will begin to save Israel and will complete the salvation of Israel in that generation. In other words, he starts, but he finishes it, which is very consistent with the words of the Lubavitch Rebbe. It says, whoever finishes the mitzvah gets the credit. Well, obviously, he didn't. And obviously, even till this day, no one has. So therefore, we're still in a waiting for the true Messiah. One who completes the task is the one, while the one who does not complete it in, in, in that generation, but dies or is broken or is taken captive. Exodus 22, verse 9, is not the one and was not sent by God. David Berger and Michael Roshrod in Jew and Jewish Christianity, in his book, in chapter 2, Jesus and the Messiah, both of us share responsibility, he says, for the full content of the book, but this chapter was assigned to me. Needless to say, I do not include this, section, this selection because it, carries an, uh, because it carries any authority either way, but because it reflects my best efforts to present the standard Jewish position in a polemical context. It also illustrates the ongoing importance to the argument of the Jewish defense against Christian mission, a point that was brought home to me just two days before I wrote this appendix. When a sophisticated activist and anti-missionary organization approached me to inquire about the means of responding to the Lubavitch belief in the Second Coming, Jews and Jewish Christianity was aimed at the popular audience, including people of high school age, and its arguments are formulated in colloquial language. Let us begin, says Rabbi David Berger. These are not my words, so please, if you're going to shoot the messenger, it's David Berger, not me. Let us begin with the fundamental belief that Jesus was and is Messiah. And the very word Christ means Messiah. This belief lies at the heart of the Christian faith. But how do we go about testing the claims that Jesus was Messiah? The first thing is to remember that the term Messiah gets a basic meaning from biblical prophecy. It only because of such prophecy that the people expected the Messiah in the first place. Any person who claimed to be Messiah must, therefore, be able to pass the very exacting test. Has he done what the Bible expects the Messiah to do? 
we must begin, and then by taking a look at the Bible as a whole, how would the Messiah of the Hebrew Bible be described by someone who has just read the text for the first time without knowledge of either Judaism or Christianity? If our hypothetical friend was perceptive reader, his first observation would be that the word Messiah simply refers to any king or high priest who was anointed with oil in accordance with the custom of ancient Israel. There is, however, the rather special king from the house of David who is described in several biblical passages as the man, the man, who will preside over a redeemed and perfected world. Eventually, Jews came to see this word Messiah, this time now with a capital M, just is justifiable to refer to that king, to that particular king. And it is in this context that any man claiming to be Messiah must be judged. In other words, he has to be a king. <laughs> in other words, the only way to define Messiah is as a king who will rule during the, what we call the Messianic Age. This central criteria on evaluating a Messiah must therefore be a single question. Has the Messianic Age come? It is only in terms of that question that the Messiah means, that the Messiah means anything. What then does the Bible say about the Messianic Age? Here is a brief description by the famous Christian scholar, the recovery of independence and power in the era of peace and prosperity, of fidelity of God and His law, of justice and fair dealing and brotherly love among men, and of personal rectitude and piety. This was said by G.E. Moore in Judaism, Cambridge, Mass. in 1927-1930. If we think more about this sentence just for a moment, in the light of history of, of over 2,000 years ago, we will begin to see that what enormous obstacle must be overcome if we are to believe in the messianic mission of Jesus. If Jesus was the Messiah, why have sufferings and evil continued and even increased in many centuries since his death? We don't know much about the messianic figures between the period of the Hebrew Bible and that time of the life of Jesus. The first Christian century, however, was a, a time when tensions between Jews and Romans uh, were reaching boiling points. And we know that at least three or four messiahs during that century he did exist and did arise before Jesus. And this is attested to even by the Christian Bible. Unlike the other movements, the one started by Jesus survived its founder. The direction of that Christianity differed from what Jesus had in mind altogether. As we shall see, we have protested his designation as God with every fiber of his being. And it's very important to understand how the belief of, that Jesus was the Messiah survived his death. In the light of what was universally understood to be the function of the Messiah, the crucifixion was a terrible logical, psychological blow to Jesus' followers. The Messiah was supposed to redeem Israel, bring peace and justice to the world, make the wolf live peaceful, peacefully with the lamb, and to see that it, turned, it learned war no more, Isaiah 2. Sometimes, in some things, it seems had gone terribly wrong. How could this paradox of a crucified Messiah be explained? Now, he goes further into a whole bunch of other series on this, which I will complete. But one thing we read, even in the book of Acts, for you Christians, the expectation, you know, everything is about how you set up expectation. The expectations of his, uh, of his emissaries after supposedly, allegedly, his resurrection which I don't see it as a resurrection, I see it basically he survived his death, it makes you ponder what happened. What's the plan? He said, are you going to, the disciples said to him, are you going to restore Israel now? Are you going to go back and kick the Romans out? I'm, we're all going to know. His response, bewildering. The day and time of, of that happening is not up to you guys. Go and preach my message to the four corners of the world, and then I'll come back. Hmm. So, wait a minute. Are you saying that we have to now teach everybody about your message and get everybody with gun ho for you, and we're going to talk to everybody about you, uh, Messiah Potential, and... And then you can come up and set it up after everybody's converted and convinced and, and we've got everything all settled down and, and you just come back and you know rule the world. Yeah, that's it. That's the plan. 
That same motif is in existence in every single messianic movement from Jesus all the way to the present. And, and believe it or not, it has a, a contingency of a form of a B'nai Noah movement as well. Because if you read in the book of Acts chapter 15, you're going to read that the non-Jewish people started believing in the one God. And a big debate took place. So what are we going to do with these, uh, these Mishagoyim, these, these non-Jews? Ah, I know. A group of Perushims, Pharisees said, They've got to, they, we have to convert them to become Jews. Good idea. They have to get circumcised. No. There's another group of Pharisees. The ones that you read in Talmud, this talks about the idea, no, let's just teach them about the universal laws. Matter of fact, a letter was written out from Jerusalem, the Council of Jerusalem, to have it distributed to all the followers of the movement. Uh, we say that all you people, we leave you guys alone. You believe in these basic universal laws. Leave them alone. Just make sure you teach them these basic four, which encumbers uh, actually seven. But you got to at least seven. If they want to learn anything about the, the, the laws of Moses, they can come to the Beth Knesset. They're allowed to come. That was first century approach Judaism to all these people coming to believe in God. I think the Perusians were correct in the first one. It would have been more of a benefit to bring them on and become part of the people. Obviously, there were those among the Perusians who disagreed, and those were the ones that won out because they saw the possibility of this massive conversion program taking place, and all of these Romans were going to become Jews. Oh, they, what was going to happen in that world? Maybe, just maybe, Maybe the realization of the dream of Mashiach coming and, and all of a sudden everybody's coming home. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. That, that means we can't have that. Let's postpone it. My friends, this happened before. We have not learned from the errors of our past. And thus, we're given that opportunity in each generation either to repeat it in every generation that the temple is not rebuilt, we're no different than that generation that destroyed it. So when I proposed in one of my videos, yes, we can go out and proselytize. Yes, we can make Jews. Yes, we should. We must. It's nothing bad. It's just the opposite. It's going to happen eventually. And those who don't want to be, okay, you stay with the seven Noahide laws. That's how the Rambam explains it. Not the way they've twisted it and say, well, you have to have first, you got to teach them first with B'nai Noahide laws, and then maybe you become a good Jew. Nope. <laughs> That's not the way the Rambam teaches it. But this is how they have interpreted his teaching. A whole different thing. Okay. So what does what do we say here? We don't know much about the Messianic figures. It says uh, Rabbi Bergram, first century, however, was in a time when tensions were highest. So where do we go from here? We go that there is no doubt that many of the first century Jews who had attraction by Jesus preaching sadly submitted to the conclusion forced upon them by his death. They had been mistaken. God had not chosen him to redeem his people and they would have to wait once more however long it may take, however much their hearts might be aching for true redemption. Jesus was said to have been resurrected. As I mentioned to you before, I don't think he was resurrected. He had resuscitated. He was survived. He was saved. He had to say, Gomel. And you'll find that as a basis of, of his interaction with Mary Magdalene. Don't touch me because I haven't yet gone up to the Father, which meant that he hadn't gone up to the temple to say the blessing for being saved from the hands of death, which is incumbent upon all Jews to say. Secondly, the Bible was examined for the purpose of finding what no one had ever seen before, evidence that the Messiah would be killed without bringing peace to the world of redemption. Third, there was an exception of a second coming at which time Jesus would carry out the task of the expected Messiah. 
And finally, there had to be an explanation for the first coming and its catastrophic end, why he didn't accomplish it the first time. The basic structure of this explanation would, would, shift, would shift the function of the Messiah from a visible level where it could be tested to one that is invisible. It could not be tested. The Messiah's goal, at least the first time around, was redemption of Israel, which had clearly not taken place from, but from atonement for the original sin and which was seen for more of an internal inner redemption whether or not such atonement was necessary it's something we'll discuss later later but as as at least no one could see says rabbi berger that it had happened imagine if you are mm, forgiven of your sins does that mean therefore death has no longer power over you does that mean that therefore mm, the lust in your heart is no longer there does that mean, therefore, you should never be sick? These are questions that is, are evoked as a result of this concept that your sins are forgiven eternally and you've been eternally forgiven. And those of you, you Christians, you think I'm just jiving with you, these questions were even asked by Paul. This is why the notion that if Jesus did not resurrect from the dead, your faith is in vain. It's zero, nilch. And it could be the whole entire Christian world has been conned, conned into believing that they are redeemed, that they are saved. And then when they go to that other world, wake up, guys, guess what? Not happening. What a shock indeed. You see, God is greater than our expectations. And when you understand that, you know that despite or in spite of it not being true, God is a God of mercy and kindness. Don't worry. If you live your life according to the fear of God, you'll have your helik in ulam haba. Not, not a problem. But it's not going to be because of Jesus. It's because you and you were crying out to God, even though you were crying out to Jesus. It was God that was listening to you and hearing your true sentiment of your heart, saying, God, forgive me. I really did wrong. That's why God forgives you. Gave you another chance. Gave you an opportunity to get back up. It wasn't Jesus. It was God. But okay, you, you, you want to believe it was Jesus? Okay, fine. God is good. His plan is beyond our minds. So please don't misinterpret this as an, as an argument which describes Jesus' disciple as cynical manipulators of religious belief. These are beliefs which resulted from powerful psychological and historical pressures and were surely sincere. We're not denying the fact that they needed this. But understanding the process that formed these beliefs should arouse some skepticism. Not about the sincerity which was where they were held, but about the truth. At this point, a little digression about the 1600 years might be helpful in giving, up, giving us another glimpse of this process. You may have heard about Shabbatai Svi. He was one of the most successful Jewish messiahs since the time of Jesus. In, 19, in, 19, in 1666, there were very, very many Jews throughout the world who believed him to be the Messiah. In September of that year, however, he was forced to become a Muslim. And ten years later, he died. The conversion was such a shock to Shabbatai's feast followers as Jesus' crucifixion was to his. Again, most Jews overcame this for the need to continue believing and bitterly resigned themselves to yet another disappointment. Others could not, and similarities between their explanation and those of Christians are really striking. I'm writing another book called The Rise of Evil. And why do I say The Rise of Evil? Because in every generation that a potential arises, there's also the arising of a potential evil. Because it did not happen. And this is what we're seeing today. We are seeing the rising of evil. Why? 
And God tells us he sends us decoys to see if we love him or we love the messenger more than him. We need to love God above all things and that would prove to God, oh, you're testing us, huh? You know what? I'm going to be... I'm going to be harder in believing that this is the guy. God, if this is your guy, prove it. Oh, we have to believe it. We have to have blind faith. No! No blind faith here. God says, this is your sent one? God, prove it. Prove it. You were with Moshe, Rabbeinu. When Moshe spoke, things happened. When he said, da, 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 it happened. And the people didn't believe until what? After he completed the job given to him. This is why the statement that you'll find in, in, in the Torah. And the children of Israel believed in God and Moses, his messenger. But that only happened only after the fact he got him out of Egypt. Not before. And you see that's the same concept. Everybody is telling you, you got to believe in him before he takes us out, before he redeems us, before he, quote unquote, saves us. No, you believe after. God's got to prove to you he's the guy. He's not the guy. Got it? So Shabbat's fee was said to be, have predicted his, predicted his conversion. And the whole recreation of the whole plan. Oh, and this is where the fusion of Kabbalah came into his, his mindset as to the reason why he had to convert because of the, the klipah had retained him and he was going to become more powerful. And uh, my friend, don't be mistaken at all. This concept of Kabbalah, mysticism, Gnosticism has had traces all the way even hundreds of years before the arrival of Jesus was here. Once again, they, they, the people examined the Bible and found out and no one had ever found before. Oh, look. And again, once again, they were successful. Where Christians, for example, found Isaiah 53 prophesied that the Messiah would be pierced. Shabbatai's follower found that he would be profaned. Mechalal in verse 5. And that could be translated that way too. And finally, they had to be given an explanation. The first coming and its catastrophic end. It's not surprising to find some Mishachis also using the same Pasul of Isaiah 53. There's even other sages who use this and indicate Isaiah 53 actually is in reference to the Mashiach, although contextually it doesn't refer to an individual. But because the Midrash says so, oh, it's the individual. It's not that it's alluded to. So here, the Messiah had to enter the world of evil to liberate the invisible sparks of holiness. This is Kabbalah. Now it's Hasidus. And while we can't go into details here, the explanation is a quite a brilliant as Christian's counterpart. Eventually, the ultimate step was in Shabbatai's feet too, came to be considered God. Ein Sof. Hmm. Nothing new under the sun. These are both fascinating episodes in the history of our faith, of our religion. In both cases, Messiah ended his career in a way that made continued belief in him impossible. In both cases, the impossible was made possible by redefining the role of the Messiah so that it would fit in this man's career and all other men who came thereafter. The Jewish people have always refused to take the easy way out. If the Bible's description of the Messiah has not been fulfilled, there is only one conclusion to be reached. He has not yet come. To the Jews, who were often subjected to mockery and contempt when asked where their Messiah was, this conclusion was painful. Sometimes even excruciating, to the, to excruciating painful. But an honest facing of all facts made, it still makes it inescapable. In adversity and in joy, through Holocaust and statehood, Jews faithful to the Torah 
and to the prophets can only repeat the words of their forefathers. I believe with complete faith in the coming of the Messiah, and though he may tarry, I will wait for him every day, hoping that he will come. My friends, we have in this past generation been given the opportunity to believe God and was tested by God to see if we would believe him or fall for another could have been, should have been, would have been. And in the same veneer that we say to our Christian brethren, it could have happened. It should have happened. It would have happened. But it didn't happen. So we say to the brethren, the Jewish brethren, who celebrate in this month of Elul, the birthday of the Baal Shem Tov and the Altar Rebbe, it could have happened. It should have happened. It would have happened. It didn't happen. I wish you and all yours a lot of shalom bracha, and may we all see ha'emet ha'torah in our lives. And with that, let the true emet ha'mashiach come now. Amen.